Great. Okay, so let's start the class uh, with uh, continue the class from the previous time. Actually, have time to do more the things. And good. So uh, today uh, we are continuing uh, the previous lecture, uh, and in particular we are talking about. Uh, Uh, finding the maximum and minimum elements. Uh, good. So we discussed uh, previous time. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, okay. So uh, we discussed previous time uh, about finding the maximum and minimum elements, and I mentioned that. Uh, Finding the maximum element, you can just find it with n minus one for maximum. Why? Because you can just compare the elements one by one. From each comparison, one of these elements will be removed, and there are n minus elements should be removed. Now, uh, what about if you find maximum and minimum? So, of course, when we find the maximum, the maximum guy, we can just uh, uh, don't consider it again because that's the maximum. So we have n minus one elements, and then we have n minus two extra pieces for a uh, minimum. Good. So in this case, then we have n minus one more. So the total, this is the for minimum. Then we have two n minus three. So the question is that can we do anything better than this or not? So uh, let's try to do I mean, uh, some uh, induction. So if you have the, let's say we have the maximum and minimum uh, so far. So we have n minus one guy. And this is the last guy. So say we have the max and mean here, good. So in that case, uh, you this is this new element. You need to compare it with max to see who is the max guy and you need to compare it with mean. So you need to essentially have two more comparisons here. Correct? And it seems that if you want to do that, essentially uh, the order would be a still 2n or something like this, or 2n minus one or 2n minus two or something like this. So that does not help us to do that. However, we are doing a, a bit different induction. We are assuming that we have the max and min of, so we have the max, and mean of the first n minus two elements. Now we consider two new elements. Good. What can we do? So here we can, so here this is the induction. So in, this is the induction hypothesis that we are, that uh, we are assuming that we know for n minus two, then from n minus two, we want to go to n. See, that is again, a nice thing that can, help a lot. So uh, what can we do in this case? We can just compare these two guys and say, who is the max guy? Who is the mean guy? So, uh, so we have one comparison here. And uh, in this case, we are finding the max and mean of, so this is the max and this is mean, say, with one comparison. Then in this case, we just uh, compare max with max and min with min. What's the meaning of that? It means that for these two new elements, how many more comparisons we are doing? We are doing three more comparisons. So for any two elements, we are doing uh, three comparisons. So what is the total things? Actually, the total would be three times n over two, which is three n over two. 
And that's the one that actually we can do it for this purpose. So we can do three and over two comparisons to find both max and mean. And that you can actually show that this is uh, the best that we can uh, hope for for max and mean. You can prove that uh, that's more complicated, but that's the thing that you can do that. Uh, good. So uh, that's uh, so this was the problem that we want to just find the max and mean, and then we can do it actually better than the regular like two and minus three that we discussed. Now let's uh, see a more general problem. So what is the more general problem that we want to solve? Uh, so this is the problem. Given a sequence x1 to xn of elements, and then an integer k, which is between k, between one and n, and we want to find the k's smallest element in s. So uh, let me just uh, uh, good. So uh, in that case, uh, what is uh, the one that we have? So uh, uh, this problem actually it is called the uh, ranking, uh, which is very important. So for example, you will go to a website like Amazon and you want to you want to buy something or you will search something or you will go to Google you want to uh, among all the items or among all the web pages it wants to show the one the top most guys uh, so here this is the case that we want to I mean you can think about that you get it the top k guys or you want to just uh, like in even as uh, like a simpler case that you want to uh, just want to find the case one. So uh, these are a uh, very important set of problems. Again, so you want to see that this list is given to you and you want to find the, the case guy in this list for you. Uh, what can we do? So uh, one simple thing would be like this. So if you want to use the idea of max and mean, the original idea of max and mean that we discussed. So uh, if, and in particular, if this K is very close to one and N. So essentially we want to find, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, the issue is that we want to find the case element and case elements after sorting. So that's the thing that we are talking, the ranking problem. So if k is equal to one or n, in that case would be k is equal to uh, mean or max, essentially. Then we can just, I mean, doing n comparison or n minus one that we have discussed for uh, mean or max. So you just find the first guy. Uh, so how can we find the case element? So you can first find the first element, the max guy. Then you will find the second max, like the next, uh, like the second max. Then you will do this one until you find the case max. Case max or case mean essentially. Uh, so what is the running time in this case would be for each of them you need to pay order N so if this is the case, then you will put it order k times n. So that's a, a one way to get it. The, another one, so you are just finding k. The other one is that you can sort the array. So if you sort the array, then of course you can get anyone that you want. In this case would be order n log n. To find the, so you can sort it and then uh, like print case element. So 
good. So that's the another approach that you can do it. So one is uh, this one that you are just finding k guy, the other one n log n. And of course, if k is less than n log n, this k n guy would be better than this. The question is that can we do even better than that? So, and this is the idea, uh, this is another, we talk about the binary search and we mentioned that the binary search actually can be used for some other problem. So the same thing here. So this idea of quick sort actually can be used for other problem as well. So uh, let's uh, remember the uh, quick sort algorithm. So what if we, uh, when we had a uh, element here, when we had a, 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 like an array, what did we do? First, we consider one element as a pivot. So we had an element as a pivot here. Then, uh, then we put all elements less than pivot here. So these are all less than p, and these are all greater than p. Good. And what was the running time for this partition was order n. Now, uh, what can we do? Uh, so just we are using exactly the same procedure, partition. We consider a random pivot, and we divide this guy into two parts. Now. Depending on what is k, so say the pivot index here is, I will call it uh, k prime. So this is the pivot index would be k prime. So I will say k prime is, So k prime is pivots index. Now we only need to compare k and k prime. If k is less than or equal to k prime, then we are uh, just going to the first half. Then we are searching search the first half. And if k is greater than uh, if k is greater than k prime, then we search the second half recursively. So this one we are doing recursively. Then we are searching the second half. But when we search the second half, the new parameter would be actually k minus k prime. This parameter, which is k minus k prime. So, uh, it, it, so uh, when we find the pivots, because we know that this, all these guys are less than uh, pivots, and all these guys are greater than pivots. So uh, we know that uh, if this element k that you want to search is less than the index of, and then we know that the index of pivots is the correct one. So this is the like the middle guy, essentially. We know this is the case. So if uh, uh, in some sense, we know it is partially sorted before pivots and after pivots. Everyone before pivots is less than pivots. Everyone after pivots is greater than or equal to pivots. So in this case, if k prime is less than, if k is less than k prime, the index of pivots, then we are just going to the first half. If it is greater than that, then we know it should be the second half. 
So then, and we know that there were k k prime elements which were less than pivot, less than or equal to pivot. So we need to remove those guys and then find the index of k minus k prime, and then we recurse on the second one. So what is the running time of this algorithm? So the running time of this algorithm. So any ideas about the running time of this algorithm? You may unmute and answer. Is it n log n? Yeah. So let's write down essentially what will happen in the good case versus back. So if uh, we have this one, so the ideal case, let me just use the other things. Yeah. So the ideal case would be like the T of n would be equal to uh, order n for partition. And say that if each of these guys, if after pivots, essentially the array is uh, divided equally or almost equally. So that would be essentially order n plus n over two. In that case would be n plus, we can expand it, n over two, n over four, n over eight and so on. And then we can just say that this, we discussed about this one plus one half, plus one fourth, plus one over eight, et cetera, which is equal to, th that would be at most two, so the whole thing would be two. So that's a good case. This n, if we have, instead of n, actually, if we have even something like this, uh, I will say, we can say two third of, like instead of n over two, we have uh, t of, two thirds of them. As long as we know that, I mean, the remaining things is a constant fraction. The, only, the search that we are doing is a constant fraction. This constant fraction can be, I mean, like closer to one. There is no need to be half. Anything, I mean, less than half, as long as it is constant, we should be in a good shape. However, one bad case would be like this. So, so this is, that would be good. So in that case, we have linear case. Algorithm, which is very good. That's the best that we could get it. For any case, guys, we can get it essentially linear in that. However, the bad case, and there's another case that can be the bad case, which can be the case t of n is equal to order n. It might be the case that, again, the pivot is the first element. So if pivot is the first element, then we have essentially this one. We can only remove one element, and then we have t of n minus one. So in this case, again, the, the running time would be this n plus n minus one plus n minus two and so on and so forth, which is n times <coughs> n plus one or two, which is essentially order the square. So in that case, actually the running time would be quadratic. So that would be quadratic. So, uh, so th there are two cases. The good case would be two to uh, essentially uh, two n. The extreme case would be other extreme case would be n square. This is the same as. Uh, Quick sort. However, if you are doing a randomized analysis like the one that we have done it for quick sort, then actually you can say that this expected uh, expected running time. So expected running time would be indeed linear. And the analysis is very similar to the one that we have done it for quick sort. I will leave it actually for you for an exercise to do that. 
and see why the expected running time of this algorithm, then we are choosing the pivot uh, as a random element in the array, actually would be linear time. So this algorithm, again, is very similar to quicksort, but it is a very good algorithm that actually can uh, get, uh, in expected, it would be only linear time algorithm, not even n log n time algorithm. And uh, the analysis would be very similar to the previous one, depending on where is this uh, things, uh, the running time of this algorithm would be different. Let me just clear all. I is there any question so far? Um, so like, uh, do you need to have the sequence sorted before you can do this? So like, a, a sequence is what? Does the sequence need to be sorted or does it no no uh, 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 that's the whole idea the whole idea that if you want to sort it then we have n log n already here the idea was that you want to get linear order n to find any case elements the running time would be order n not even k n k n is easy you are just finding for each other the whole idea that without sorting we are doing that the only thing is that we just consider this pivot and based on the fact that this k is less than the index of the pivot or greater than the index of pivot, we are recursing in only one of these. So that's, that's the main difference between this and quicksort. So in quicksort, we needed to sort both parts here and here. But in here, we only go, either we go here or we go here, one of them. So we go either to left or right. And as I mentioned, if this left and right are somehow balanced, then we can easily get a linear time algorithm. If they are not balanced, potentially can be n square, but uh, in the average, it would be balanced, very similar to the one that we have shown for uh, quick sort. And because of that, the running time of this would be linear order n. It is independent of k as well. That's very important. And no log n. Then how do we know that the other, the other half won't have the k smallest element? So okay. if, if the if k is less than the uh, pivot, then how do we know that the other half, the right half, doesn't have the k smallest? Uh, 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 because we know that all these guys are greater than the pivot. So uh, uh, because I mean, uh, if k is less than k prime, the one that we discussed here. So we know that all those elements after pivots. Uh, they will be all larger than pivot. So we know that, the, uh, so in some sense, we know that the, these elements from uh, the beginning to the pivot, these are the first, these are the lowest k prime elements in the array. So if there is, if, and we want to k less than k prime, so it should be among these guys. That's the whole idea. Oh, so, oh, so it's like after being partitioned. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the thing that we are using the partition. Partition is doing partition in some sense is doing partial sorting for us, but we don't need to have the full sort essentially. And uh, this is the idea that sometimes we do the partition and then uh, then we only focus on the part that we want to continue. That's the reason that we will go on that one and we are doing things on that area and so on and so forth. Uh, great, good. So uh, uh, this is uh, essentially the things that we discussed. And uh, it would be good if you uh, read these two sections of the book. Uh, this is the Introduction to Algorithms uh, Udi Member's book, A Creative Approach. That's actually had uh, lots of other, this type of problems that you may find essentially interviews, et cetera. That's a, a good set of problems that you can go and uh, read and have a good understanding about the class. Uh, so that's about uh, this. Let me clear all drawings. So we have a thing how you can analyze the quick sort. And again, this is the exercise for you to analyze this algorithm, the average case running time of this algorithm. You can do it very similar to the one that we have done it for quick sort and get actually linear in N expected running time for the problem.
but please do that. Uh, so let's go for the, so we are done with this part, this quick short part. Let's talk uh, briefly about hashing as well. Uh, good. So, uh, we are just briefly talking about uh, hashing and hash table. Uh, as we discussed uh, at both uh, C++, C++ we have the mapping concept. And in Python we have We have dictionaries. In both of cases, these are actually, these are the hashing. So uh, uh, what is a uh, hashing? So uh, hashing in general, uh, like uh, when you, uh, what's the difference between mapping and the regular things? So uh, if an array. So in the array, when we have array one, so we have, uh, I don't know, length n array. This is the length n array. Array of links in. Links in. And then we are saying, uh, what is array one? So array one is the first one, array two, and so on and so forth. Array k, for example that we can uh, do it. And uh, this is the one that uh, you can access the case array. Uh, good. Now, uh, the question is that, uh, what about uh, these elements? Uh, so it might be the case that if the, if the universe, so what is the universe that we are trying to essentially find it? So the universe that here we have it is uh, between zero to n minus one. This is the one that we are talking about the universe. And so we have two important things here. And let me just mention. So we have two parameter, u and m. What is u? In this case, actually both u and m are equal. u is the universe. So we want to say array essentially zero, zero to u minus one. This is the universe U. And then uh, we want to uh, store it in uh, like from one to M. So M is the space. So M is the space and U is the universe. Good. And as I mentioned, in this particular case, these two are equal. So uh, you always have a, it, it, but, but in general, U and M can be not equal. So what's the meaning of that? It means that we want to put, I mean, a very large set of uh, numbers. You want to say array, I don't know, 10 million. But you know that the total number of elements that you are dealing with are 100. So in this case, it would be not wise to have an array of 10 million size 10 million to essentially keep only 100 items. In this case, for example, you would be 10 million because you can, like the elements would be between zero to 10 million. But the a space that you really need for them, it would be M would be just, uh, 100. So hashing will be useful for the case that M uh, is much, much smaller than U. In a sense, the elements that we want to put it, uh, 
are much as uh, the space or the number of them is much smaller than the universe of the all possibilities of them. Again, you may have, so one example, you may have 100 numbers and the range of you might be between zero to 10 million. So in that case, you have only 100 elements, but U is between zero and uh, 10 million. And this U actually uh, can come out of some encoding as well. So it might, you may encode some strings or other things and you get such a large thing. That's exactly the thing that we are doing actually. So uh, the question is that in this case, how can we have an array such that the indices are between zero to 10 million, while the size of the array is only 100. And of course, if M is the order of U, so if is M is the order of U, or U is the order of M, I think that might be better. So if uh, u is the order of m, then we should be fine. So if, I don't know, if u is only 1,000 and m is 100, maybe in this case, we don't mind to have an array of one size 1,000. But as I mentioned, if u is much larger than m, we want to find a better, uh, essentially, algorithms. And the best things essentially for this one would be hash table, uh, hash functions essentially. So the solution would be the hash function. Good. So, <laughs> Hash function essentially resolves this issue. And hash function, as I mentioned, so this uh, idea that you are using in C++ and Python, uh, you can have a dictionary and mapping is also a dictionary essentially. Uh, by the way, in C++ you have two things. You have the unordered, unordered map. This unordered map actually is using hashing. There is a regular ordered mapping. That mapping actually is using binary trees. That is different. So uh, in some sense, unordered map are in general in expectation are faster than ordered map or regular map. And unordered map are the one that have that have been implemented using hashing. You can actually go and read more about them, the difference between these two. But yeah, we have two things. We have the regular mapping and we have unordered mapping. Unordered mapping actually has been uh, used uh, or implemented via hashing. O ordered mapping uh, would be, uh, are implemented using binary trees uh, or binary search trees. And in that case, the running time of this, uh, the algorithm using mapping are order log n versus for hashing generally are order one. So in some sense, uh, unordered mapping can be faster than mapping. So this is the randomized algorithm and the other one is, uh, I mean, no randomization in it. So uh, here we are talking about the hashing function. Again, for the case that the universe that you want to put these elements, you want to array, say array u and like array, I don't know, u over two or something like this. And u can be much larger than m, uh, which is the space or the number of them in some sense. So you expect that only you have 100 numbers in the range of zero to 10 million. And uh, generally the operations that we want to do it, so these are the array operations. What do we have it? These are called dictionary operations. That's the reason that actually at Python it is called dictionary. So we have insert, search, and delete. These are the three operations. So you want to uh, essentially say, uh, 
like a insert, you want to put array one equal to something. You may want to delete array one. So say array one to none. So the default say is none essentially for each of them or NAN. So the, it, the default for each of them is essentially NAN. Then you are, uh, 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 you may want to put an uh, array one equal to, uh, I don't know, uh, to some numbers. So you may want to delete array one. You may want to uh, ins uh, insert some number to say array one is equal to, you may want to say uh, array one equal to, for example, five, you may want to delete it and delete in some sense array one should be NAN, or you may want to actually see what is the value of array one. In that case would be five. So these are the operations that we have insert, search and delete. That's the operation that we want to do it. But all of them will be done if we have just an array of this. Good. So uh, let me uh, uh, continue here. So, uh, okay. So one good thing is this one. So if you have this array, like uh, a typical approach, when you have this kind of uh, large universe U and M is a small. So one thing that you will consider is whenever you want to, if you want to say array I, so if you want to put array I and I is greater than M, what can we do? What would be a natural algorithm to do that? We know that at most M numbers are coming or we are dealing with uh, M numbers. Modular. What can, yeah, go ahead. Modular. Yeah, exactly. So that's, I mean, typical thing that we are doing. So anything that is circular or other, we discussed actually this one for circular linked list, for example, that would be array of I mod. So that would be a natural way to do that. The only thing here is that we may have some collision. So what is the collision? Is that if we have, for example, a I mod M and the other next time we are talking about the array of I plus So what about if we have array of i plus m mod m? So in that case, both of them, because m mod m would be nothing. So both of these guys are going to the same place essentially. So this guy is going to here, and this guy is going to here as well. So that's the thing that we call collision. And uh, whatever we do, there is some chance of collision, but first we want to reduce that. To reduce that, uh, this is the concept that we are using. We are, I mean, we need to do randomization. So you cannot just put it, I uh, uh, just go I mod F. You need to do a little bit more randomization and then say that with this, uh, this uh, radi randomization that we are adding, actually then we are in a good shape. That's the whole idea of hashing. So hashing, it is essentially mod M, but plus some randomness. And then this randomness, we can provably say that, what is the chance of collision? What is the probability of collision? So that's the whole concept of hashing. Okay, uh, so let's discuss a little bit about this function. How can we define this function and what are the, prob the probability of collision that can happen? Uh, let me just read everything. Is it clear so far, the idea? Yes. And good, so let me. Good, so let me bring this one down.
So uh, this is the whole idea that uh, we are talking about. So we find that when we want to hash, actually, uh, like for example, in uh, C++, you can hash anything. You can hash a class of, an, uh, uh, essentially, objects of a certain class. So it might be not just integers or a string, but the general idea would be like this. Anything you can either, these integers are in some sense are strings. Either we have a strings of bounded lengths or a strings can have uh, essentially not necessarily bounded lengths. Everything you think if we can, for example, this is the idea of a JSONify. So we can essentially make everything uh, like, as a, you can consider everything as a JSON and you can make all of this JSON actually, you can just uh, make it as a string. So in some sense, every item, every object that we have, it would be some sort of strings that you need to map it. As long as we know how we can do that, then essentially we can map anything. So for example, you may define a class of graphs and then you will say that graph, like this is one graph, this is the, another graph, third graph, each of them, you can just say, for example, array of a graph one. So I will call it G1. G1 is a graph. So it's essentially the class, it's an object of a class. And in C++, you can actually do that. Or like Python, you can say array of G1. So uh, G1 in some sense is the index. The, the whole graph itself is the index. Why? Because this uh, G1, you can actually make it at the end, either to JSON and then to a string, or directly you can change it to a string. And the strings, we will discuss how you can do the map. Uh, that's essentially the whole uh, idea of uh, hashing. So uh, let's uh, go to this one. So what are the type of things that we have? It? So generally, we want to, I mean, consider integers or characters of fixed lengths or variable lengths. So it can be essentially fixed length. So in general, we have, a, so you can think about, so you have one thousand, this is the number. You can consider it like a, a number, a string of length four essentially. So either this is a string of length four or it can be essentially just general strings. So the strings can be larger than that. And if you know how can we do the hashing for them, essentially we can hash anything. So that's is exactly the way that is uh, currently implemented in C++ or Python. So let's start with integers. How can we do that? So uh, this is the original proposal. So, again, the whole idea is that we need to use a little bit randomization such that the collision, the chance of collision actually goes down. So this is the original proposal of Carter and Wegman to pick a prime number P greater than or equal to U. So the, if you say that the universe is U, uh, so this is the range. So U is the range in some sense. U is the universe or the range. So select a number P which is greater than U and then define this function as the things. So instead of just mod x mod p, uh, so uh, uh, instead of just doing uh, these simple things like x <laughs> mod m, you do a little bit more complicated thing. So you will do this function h of a b x. That's the important one. You will put it a x plus b. Then you will do it mod m, sorry, mod p, for that random p that we discussed essentially greater than u. And then you will take the whole things, mod m. <laughs> so that's the main thing. So instead of just doing x mod m, because as I mentioned, if you just put in x mod m and then x plus m mod m would be goes to the same thing. So here, uh, how do we do that? So p is some uh, prime number greater than u. Uh, what about a and b? a and b are randomly chosen integers mod p with the condition that a is not equal to p. So first we are choosing a random number p greater than u. I mean, generally we have the list of numbers. So if we have <laughs> these things, if P is large enough, then we can do that. 
so there are some standard P actually that if you search, for example, that P plus plus has been used or at Python, you can go uh, dive, uh, have a um, deep dive there and find exactly what is the P that they are using it. But as long as P is greater than U, the range, then uh, A and B are randomly chosen integers mod P. So the randomness here is A and B. With A not equal to zero, then you are put, computing A x plus B mod P mod M. So that's the general idea that we will call it. This is the H A B function. So this is the H of A B. So we don't just do it mod x, but we are doing a bit more complicated. Then that's essentially the things that we are doing it. Now, what about if it is not, not one, uh, one integer, but what about a fixed length array? So we know that the input is x is equal to x0 to xn minus 1. Now, uh, these are like integers. Like you can think about each of them is a byte or a character. Then what is the edge of the whole vector? The whole vector that we have it, it is like this one. It is, uh, this is very similar. So, so we, it, essentially this is the array of the previous type of integers. So what do we do? Uh, so we are just sum it up, i equal to zero to n minus one. We are hashing each of these xi's independently. And uh, uh, again, so hi, the only thing is that hi is different for each position i. So we have h i of b before we didn't have, we have h a of b. Here we have h i of a b. So for each i, we are randomly choosing a b mod p such that a is not equal to zero. Then uh, when we have a length uh, essentially, so if the length is n, so uh, for each of these guys, for each of them, we have a different hash function. What is the hash function here for the i's position would be h i of a b. But h i of a b is nothing that the one that we discussed before. Then for this position, you are just using a hash function for that guy. Then you will sum it up and then you will take the mod m. So that's the idea that you can do. So in some sense, this is the way that as in some applications, actually, you may want to do your own hashing. That's the way that you can do that. This is the hash function. Now, what about hashes a string? So strings are the one that the lengths are not limited. So in that case, what can we do? Uh, so here, the length of the string can be. <laughs> so if we know that the, the maximum length of this string is some n, then it would be better to just use this array approach. If not, <laughs> then we can uh, use this new function. Uh, uh, so assume that the string that you have is this one, x0, x2, x1, x2 to xl, where uh, a good bound on l, the length of this array is not known. So uh, a prior, we don't know what is L. So if it well, if we know L, then we can just use the previous approach that I have mentioned. <laughs> so in that case, uh, what do we know? Uh, and again, each of these x u itself it are between zero to u minus one. So uh, these are in some sense these are the all characters. I don't know. These are at most uh, eight bit lines. So uh, like. Uh, if it is a, a array, so for example, an array of lengths eight, we know that the maximum is a, is a, is a byte, then the maximum value would be two to the eight. Uh, which is like 256. So in, in that case, uh, so still in some sense, each of these xi have some limitations, but the length of this array might be large. So what do we do in this case? So uh, we are defining this function. So uh, H C of X hat, the whole string, would be H A B. H A B is the same thing that we have defined before, this one. 
So what is the HAB? So we will essentially make the whole things as just one big number. How do we do that? We are computing this number, i equal to zero to L, xi times c to the i. So c to the power of i mod p. Here again, a, b, and c are randomly chosen numbers mod p. With a and c are not equal to zero. So the difference here is that uh, first we are computing this number. Uh, this is the uh, i equal to zero to l, uh, x i c to the i mod p. So we will compute this one. We are just, in some sense, we are just choosing a random number c, which is not equal to zero mod p, the same p that was greater than u. And u was the, we knew that each x i is in this range. Then we will compute this, um, uh, this one, i equal to zero to l x i times c to the i, so c to the power of i. Then we will compute this one, we will compute mod p, and then we are computing h a b of this guy, where the uh, a and b are, again, some random numbers. And then this would be the hash function for the whole x. And again, this string is somehow is the most general thing, because anything else, we can actually uh, almost represent it as a JSON, and the JSON, you can essentially make it as a text, and this text would be a string that you try to hash it. So in some sense, we can hash everything, a graph, an object, anything. The only thing that we need to have is that uh, universe U is much as, uh, is, uh, so the number of elements that we have it should be much smaller than U. Uh, and uh, if it is not the case, I mean, you need to be careful that if the, the size that you have it, I don't know, is 100, but you try to put 101 elements in it, then there is something that is called collision happens because there is not much space. And this is the pigeon hole principle that if you have 100 place and you have, if you put 101 elements, there is one that is more than one element with go there. And that's exactly the collision. So here, first, uh, let's understand a little bit about the probabilistic ideas about collisions. <clears throat> so a function is called universal, a hash function. If for any x, y belonging to u and x like any things in the range u and x are not equal to a probability of that hashing of x is equal to hashing of y is less than or equal to one over that so in some sense that's the ideal case because i mean uh, you want to make sure that uh, like the probability so if you have essentially n numbers and you want to put it in and beans, that's in some sense is the best thing that you can hope for. So uh, here we have this things that probability of two numbers become equal is one over M. And here in some sense, we have M places here, and we want to make sure that any two numbers that you will consider it, the probability that hash of these guys are going to the same number would be at most one over M. Interestingly, all functions that I, we have discussed for the integers, for fixed length array, and for strings of unbounded, all of them providing such a guarantee for that. <clears throat> uh, so this kind of, uh, is this universality gives also another important thing. The universal hashing also has this property that any element is equally likely to hash in any slots that we have. We call it uniform hashing. So any elements that you are bringing, because of this randomness that we have mentioned, there is an equal chance, uh, if it is universal, to go to any of these. So the chance are equal.
So chances are equal that this element goes to any of these guys. Uh, that is the one that we call it a uniform hashing. So uh, we have this concept of universal that the probability of any two elements go to the same place would be one of, <laughs> at most one over M. And this actually results in another property that is called uniform hashing. That if you consider any element, it goes to any of these guys would be equal probability. So, uh, and you can actually go through that. I don't want to go through this, but you have the knowledge of probability things. You can go and read exactly why this, uh, if you are considering uh, So uh, if you consider, for example, this particular things, why if we have this one, then we have this universal property. You can actually search Wikipedia or papers, or you can see actually the original paper of uh, Carter and Wegman that they are talking about this uh, hash function. And why do we have this kind of universal property? And essentially the fact that two numbers are going to the same place would be at most one over n. And this results in this uniform uh, uniform hashing that actually uh, if you have, a, it, so this is something is equivalent of that, that if this is at most n, so you can say that uh, like each element will go to any place uh, in the array with equal probability. You can read about that one. But uh, uh, one thing that I want to discuss here a bit more about it, Uh, so this, uh, uh, any hashing that you are doing it, and we said that the probability is at most one over M, but the issue is that this probability is not zero. So if it is not zero, there is a chance of collision. And again, collision is that two elements, because of this randomness, they want to go both go to the... So we always have this chance of collisions uh, to, uh, that two elements going to the same uh, arrays, uh, to the same slot. It is at most one over n, but it still is not zero. So it can happen. So what can we do? So one, one idea is the collision resolution by chaining. So how can we do that? So we can put all the elements that are uh, essentially, uh, so what is the idea? If the first guy is coming here, so the first guy is coming, so we have this hash function. The first guy is coming here, we are just putting it here. So we can essentially create a link list or something. So the first guy that is coming here, so this is say R1 is coming here, it comes, it goes to here. Then the second guy is R2 is coming. Then it, you are going to the second guy. R1, R2, and so on. So as long as you have this kind of hashing, uh, then uh, like this kind of link list, you don't lose anything. So when you are hashing this function R1, we are computing the hash function and we will insert this R1. Here, there is a key essentially that we are inserting this guy. So this key and the value, both of them should be essentially kept in R1. Then you have the R2, the second element, and you have a linked list out of it. In this way, this is the one that we have it here as well. We make sure that you are not losing any element. Because uh, th the idea is that you will give a particular, uh, so uh, uh, what do we do? For example, we have a dictionary or a mapping, for example. And uh, this mapping of, for example, I don't know, uh, key K we will put it some value. So in that case, this map of KV, so we will map, essentially we are just considering this K, we are applying this function HAB of K to find the correct place here. And when we want to insert it in R1, 
we need to insert both k, actual k, and v. So we have this K and V. So this K and V will be also deposited in or stored essentially in the first, in this element of the link list. And it is important because why? Because the, this guy, the R2 that comes, it, the, the key for that might be, so this guy is the key is K, but for uh, this, this is for say R1. But here R2 is coming. It may have a different key, K prime. So in that case, it is important. We will, uh, whenever you want to insert or delete, you will just insert it. We will, and we will insert it into this link list. But in this link list, we have for each element, we said, what was the original key and V? Because why? Because when we go there, if you want to search, if you want to insert or delete, you will now go to this link list and you will search for a particular K, uh, for a particular key, K that it was there. And for that one, you are doing the insertion or deletion on this link. So uh, these are the operations that we can do it. We can insert X at the head of a link list, uh, or we can search, we will, whenever we want to search, we are just searching with a key in the list, this one, H of K. And again, they may have a different key. So we need to also, so we cannot just remove this key here. So we need to also keep the original key because different keys may be hashed to the same table, to the same place. So we need to have, we need to essentially have a track of what was the original key K. And then we can report the value and we can delete it from the link list. So all of them would be easy. One other interesting thing, actually the one that is uh, implemented also in C++, you don't have actually, you don't need to, you can call each of them the bucket. <laughs> so we have uh, some, uh, uh, bucket essentially, and then bucket size. So instead of having essentially a linked list, if you know that the maximum number of co collision with high probability is at most, I don't know, is 10 or I don't know, maybe 15 or 100. Then instead of a linked list, you can have an array of size 100 for this guy. So you know that with high probability, the, the length of this, so there is a small chance that you are essentially, uh, the size of the uh, array, this, the number of elements that you are putting becomes more than 100. But the chance is so small that essentially this chance probably is smaller than somebody essentially is uh, hit by a, uh, like lightning or thunderstorm. So the chance is so low that never happened. So what can you do? So instead of this uh, link list to make it more efficient, you may actually keep an array. And this is the one that is called budget size. So instead of uh, having a link list, which can have a variable length, to make it more efficient, you can have a budget size. And this is the one actually, if you go to unordered map in C++, uh, then there you can actually find the, the number of buckets, the size of the buckets, everything. So you can implement this one instead of a uh, linked list by just some uh, array of fixed lengths. But you know that the lengths, they, are, they just take, because we can compute what is the probability. You will take the probability uh, the bucket size large enough that you never exceed uh, the bucket size. Of course, you cannot say never, but the chance would be so small that almost always does not happen. So, uh, and okay, so uh, here, uh, this is the worst case running time for insertion is order one. Uh, so if you consider this one, so let's just discuss about the running time of these operations. So the, if you want to insert an element, then it would be easy because you just, insert it at the head of the list. If you want to search an element, you need to go through the size of this bucket or this link list. 
which would be the size of this bucket size. But because of this, this is the important thing, because of the uniformity property. So what is the uniformity property? We knew that each guy goes to each of these buckets with equal probability. So if you have N elements that you are inserting and the size of the array is M, the chance, uh, so uh, we know that the expected size of this array would be N over M. So <laughs> what's the meaning of that? If you know that you want to insert essentially n elements into this array, and the size of this uh, hash essentially structure is m, you know that the size of these guys would be n over m. Each of them, the size of this linked list would, would be n over m. So if you want to search an element, you need to pay n over m uh, because that's expected size of, so this is the expected, <coughs> Uh, size of a bucket. So uh, this is, and this is the one that you need to pay essentially for if you want to do the search. And if you want to delete also, you need to find this guy. So if you want to insert it easy, if you are using the link list, you just insert it at the beginning. Or if it is an array, the same thing, you, you always insert it at the last element. But if you want to do search or delete, then you need to pay N over M. And what is N? Is N is the number of elements that you are essentially inserting. In, you have it at any time maximum in the array. And the expected size would be N over M. M is the size of this array that you are keeping it. And we know that the expected size of this bucket would be N over M. So if you want to make it actually, the probability is very low, as I mentioned, if you want to have a fixed array, you may keep an array of, I don't know, 10 times M. If you keep a fixed array of fixed size 10 times M, this, uh, the probability goes exponentially down. And you know that with almost always, the size of the number of guys that you are putting in an array would be not greater than the same size of this bucket, essentially. Uh, so that's the, uh, and, and one important thing, if the number of uh, elements that you are inserting here is essentially order M, the size of this, then in this case, all of these guys N over M become the order one and everything would be order one. So that's again, this is very similar to the one that is, uh, implemented in uh, the unordered map in C++. You can go out, lots of them are very similar to this. So there is, this is one way, there is another way that I want to, so this is one way is that uh, it is called collision, collision resolution by chaining or putting a fixed array, essentially some kind of putting some reserve there that if collision happens, you have enough space to insert this guys. Another way that exists, uh, So the, the second way that exists actually, it is called open addressing or linear probing. So what is that in open addressing? So here in the open addressing, this is the way that we are doing. So you are building some, uh, <coughs> so we have only array of size uh, M. So we have an uh, array of M. So you are inserting the first guy. So the R1 is the one that is coming and inserted. So R1, as long as this place, so each of these elements either would be empty. Uh, there are three states we can have it. So first one is empty. If it is empty, you will insert it. Then R1 will go and insert here. So this is the one that we are talking about the linear problem. Now, if R2 is coming here, it comes here and say, oh, R1 is already there. So I cannot insert it. I will go to the next slot and I will insert that. Now, if R3 is coming, you are going, so you don't have any linked list or anything. R3 is coming, you will say R1 is here, R2 is here, I will come and do it R2. Maybe another guy is coming and wants to do it in R2, this is R4. Then this guy, you are starting from R4, this is the hash one, this is H, A, B, and then you will say, oh, I cannot insert here, I cannot insert here, I will insert it.
Good. So this is essentially the way that we are doing inserting. So we don't have any extra space essentially here. We always insert in the same array. Uh, however, for insert, it would be like this. Then for search would be like this. So when you want to search, so you want to see whether R4 is in the array or not, or say this is R5 you want to search. So R5 is coming here. So you want to search. So you will go here, R5. Is it R5 here? No. Then you will come. If it is the next one is not empty, you need to still continue. So this is R5, no. Then R4 is no, and then it is empty space here. So at that time, you say, oh, I couldn't find R5, so no R5 in my hashing. So you need to do this kind of, this, that's the thing that is called linear probing. So always using this function, essentially we, we have this H of A, B of, R5. So using this one, you are finding what is the actual place. But when you go to actual place, if it is not there, you are not there. You are not done. You need to go down one by one until you make sure that whether this guy is, either you will find it. If you find it, then you are done. But if you don't find it, you need to continue to find an empty spot. And then you can insert it there. And then you decide that this guy is done. Now, what about delete? So for the delete, you need to uh, delete and search are very similar. So for the say, for example, here you are doing say the R five is here. So for the delete, when you go there and you want to say we want to delete here, let me just use another color here. Yeah. So here you want to uh, delete R four. So what do we do in this case? So we will go to R4. So we are just this H function, we go to R4. Then we are uh, continuing this. Okay, here we need to first find it. So we are doing the search. We will go here, it's not there. We will continue, continue, we will continue here. Here the issue that, okay, this is R4 and we can delete it. But the issue is that this delete, you should not make it empty. So that's the thing that we need to have another character. I, I will call it essentially a special character, say minus one, for example, here. So if all of them are positive. So here, when you delete R4, you should not put it essentially NAN. You need to put it, or empty, you need to put it minus one. So here is minus one, which is different, for example, for NAN here. Why minus one is important? Because minus one says that, so uh, uh, th this is important because for other guys, now if you, for example, if you come here to find to find R5, you are coming here and say, okay, R2 is not here, R R3 is not equal to R5. Then if this one is empty, you are ending here, which is wrong it, because this R4 has been deleted here. So when you put minus one, it means that minus one, it means that continue the search. So you need to continue and then you will find R5. So for the deletion, when we delete something, we cannot just put it empty. We can uh, actually, if we need to have a special character, this is a special character that whenever in the search, we are reaching this guy, you will, it says that, okay, uh, you should uh, continue. However, if you want to insert it, we can insert it. So this minus one guys, if this, if you are doing another R, I don't know, another R6 here, So if R6 are coming here, so there is no space here, no space here, no space here, and no space here. But here, actually, in the R4, we can, it was minus one. No, we can actually delete it and put it R6. So we can always put a new element, insert it. But this minus one is important to be there so that for the search or delete, you need to continue. It was not an empty space. Anyhow, so that's the one that is called a linear probing. And... Uh, so uh, here you can see actually the uh, running time of this algorithm. So the running time of this algorithm is generally would be order one in expectations. However, uh, 
uh, this is uh, like an expectation in order one. In general, in the worst case, it may become very bad and you may need to actually do it even linear end to find an element when you do this linear problem. So, uh, and generally it depends on the load factor, which is this N over N. So one idea essentially is this one. When you are, so as you will see, when we are doing insertion and deletion, lots of these places, especially when we are doing deleting, lots of these spaces here becomes minus one. These minus ones are make essentially the things inefficient. The idea is that uh, this is if you want to use the linear probing. So after some times that you are using linear probing, you may essentially rehash. You may reconstruct the whole things. So uh, you may have done, say, essentially you have done this one, but now it's like, okay, this hash structure has been ruined in some sense after some time. So in that case, you are just, uh, essentially going through this hash, all the elements which are in this hash, you are inserting uh, them into a new hash. So that way, actually, you, you will make sure that there are not too many minus ones. Because again, the minus ones make this one inefficient because there are less, we are, we need to, these elements are not really in the array, but still we need to go through them to see whether the next guy is there or not. So, uh, uh, so that, that's the thing that is called. So this one is called uh, uh, So uh, if the number of, uh, as I mentioned, if the number of deletions are a lot, then we can rehash the whole thing, it means that hash it into a new array. So all elements that currently we have it, except, I mean, of course, the deleted guys are there. So you will go through the whole array uh, of this after some time. So you are essentially playing with this until it becomes dirty in some sense. Okay, I want to just get rid of this hashing and I will insert it into a new hash, such as there is no minus one. Again. That's the idea that you can do it, actually make it uh, more efficient. Uh, and you can actually go and search more about this kind of, hashing via linear probing. And uh, there are codes online that they are implementing this one efficiently. And you can read more about it, uh, like what, what is the, but as I mentioned, uh, so generally it is order one uh, expect, but it depends how many deletions you are doing. The deletions possibly can ruin essentially the array. And this order one can be becomes much larger, uh, potentially even order n. If you, so you can think about it, you have inserted all these elements. So this is one case that it can be actually very bad. So you may think about this guy that you want to insert these arrays one by one. So this is, the, this is the R1, but R1 was essentially here. It was empty. So it was occupied. Then this one is occupied. You have, you went essentially and inserted R1 here because all of them, the actual place of R1 was here, but you have inserted here at the end of the array because all of them were free. Now, next time, then these guys, and they are, they are deleting these guys one by one. So if you delete all of these guys one by one, then when you come again for R1, so then you see, okay, R1 is not here. I need to continue. Minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So the running time of this algorithm would be actually order. So, uh, so to just do the search instead of order one, you need to do it order n because of all these minus ones were there and we have deleted it. So, but of course, these are some probabilistic things. You need to see what is the chances doing that. But an adversary can ruin these things by essentially inserting all of these guys. Uh, and then you essentially delete it. Uh, and then you need to do it order n. But again, the chance here would be not that much because the next guy is also inserted here because we needed to have this property that all of these guys are essentially inserted uh, here. But anyhow, uh, you can actually read more about it on that. I just mentioned that in the worst case, the running time of a search can be order M, not order. Any question? So do you hear me? 
great. Yeah, so I think we are done. I just wanted to finish this hashing things. So next time we are continuing with the rest of the materials. And here, yeah, you can actually read more about it. This hashing is a very active area. It is something it's called distributed hash table. These are like the one that currently in lots of cloud computings are using it, especially distributed hash tables uh, uh, or others that you can read more about them. They are doing some kind, because in some sense, they are doing some balancing of the load essentially. And uh, very active area, and you can uh, read uh, a lot about them in the literature. And the people are still working at this one that I mentioned, just some introduction into hashing, the thing that exists. But especially these distributed hashes are very important that you need to go and, I mean, you can go and read more about them. Uh, good. If there is nothing else, we can finish uh, the session here.